My name is Bob Kasinchek, and I'm a taxonomist uh, and a director of business development at Excess Innovations. The small shop I work for is a metadata and taxonomy specialty shop located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I've trekked a long way to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about creating knowledge graphs from structured data. The main idea here is pretty simple. Uh, you have a bunch of structured data. So it should be pretty simple to pull a bunch of triples out of it, right? Right, so that was the genesis of this talk because it actually turns out there are a whole lot of things to consider when you're doing this. Um, and after I wrote most of this talk, it became pretty clear to me uh, that I'm touching on a whole bunch of stuff and I'm not really to get uh, able to get into a whole lot of depth into any of it. So I'll be happy to talk more about it later, but I'm gonna uh, touch on a whole bunch of things uh, this afternoon. Um, so what I'd like to do is offer some perspective and some lessons learned and to identify some common, or I think what would be common, pitfalls and potential stumbling blocks when trying to do a triples project. Um, so I hope that it's useful and provides insight into your own projects. And at the end, um, I have a slide uh, with some links for other resources that you can consult, and I'll be happy to distribute slides if anyone's interested. So to jump right in, this particular use case uh, that I'm going to describe comes from the world of scholarly publishing. Uh, we do a lot of work with scholarly publishing clients, so these are academic publishers of uh, journals with articles, you know, research articles in them. Um, and we do a lot of work in that sector, but the principles should apply to any organization uh, that's producing content, other publishers, media companies, anyone who has a large amount of content. Um, this talk is not a primer on graph databases. I'm not going to spend a lot of time advocating for how cool they are and all the cool stuff you can do with them, although obviously I'll touch on it a little bit. Um, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining in great detail all the cool things that you can do with graph databases. There are plenty of resources out there. I'll link some of them at the end of my talk. Um, and there are some graph database companies here that you can talk to. Uh, gra graphs, I think it's clear though, are pretty hot in the information space right now. What I do hope is that even though this use case is specific to scholarly publishing and uh, describes how and why you would want to express your structured data um, from XML into a graph, but that the processes and the potential pitfalls that I will describe are things you might encounter in your own projects. Um, if you have structured data, uh, and it doesn't have to be from XML, it could be in relational tables, it could be um, uh, any kind of structured content, um, that it's possible to convert them to an RDF graph database. Um, and I hope to lay out a few of the foreseeable problems and pitfalls that you may encounter. Um, I will say that graphs are an excellent way to store and query information that's full of relationships that can't be well explicated in traditional databases, by which I mostly mean tables, uh, because the relationships are too hierarchical or too complex to store and query from a traditional form. Um, but in this case, the uh, use case I'm gonna describe, it's from a vast quantity of structured content. Because for scholarly publishers, as well as other content-driven organizations, I'm just gonna stop saying that, and you'll understand that it applies to other cases, um, their content is their most important data asset. Uh, most scholarly publications are expressed in some kind of XML format. There are various standards in the industry, uh, but they're all flavors of a basic XML schema uh, that contain the parts of the manuscript, the title, the abstract, the authors, the institutions that they are described with, the date, the journal information, you know, volume, issue, number, um, and things like that. Um, it's not important that you're familiar with this particular set of schemas to understand what I'm going to say, only that you see that the data is well fielded um, and it's easy to manage, understand, and extract. XML is excellent for two purposes. It's very easy for transmittal and it's very easy for display. What it is not is a database. Um, so XML is great and the reason articles are published in this format is because they're easy to turn into viewable web pages, uh, PDFs, or even print, shocking thing of all things, uh, but it's not good as a queryable data asset. Um, so the problem basically is that 900,000 journal articles is not a database that you can query. Data-minded publishers have sales, marketing, uh, and executive units that want to be able to ask questions about their data. You might want to ask a question like, how many articles from authors from Harvard did we publish in our top three journals last year? Or 
what are the most popular topics in the top 100 views articles or other ways that you might want to interrogate this data which is sitting in 900,000 discrete XML files and is not readily queryable. Um, you could try and write a script to write those kinds of queries, but it certainly is not doing anything for self-service user um, analytics to be able to discover things about their content. So um, further, XML is not designed for any kind of inferencing. So in this scholarly content, there are a whole bunch of relationships that you can explicate in a graph that are not really explicable in the uh, XML format that they're in. I mean, if you squint really hard, you can kind of see an ontology there, but it's not, it's not really there. Um, so since the data in this XML is fielded, um, XML is a great candidate for turning things into an RDF knowledge graph. So if the goal is to be able to ask questions about the data and draw inferences about the content, RDF is an excellent candidate because that's exactly what it's designed for. Now, I have to say that I'm not the first person ever to think about or advocate for this. Um, I've included some source materials later at the end that you can use um, as references and uh, resources for your own projects. Um, and I really not, um, I'm more interested in the processes and the problems specific to the case I'm describing because I think they're generally applicable and interesting. So the goal is really to turn a huge pile of this into something that looks more like this. Um, now, having a graph is great, um, and now we can describe the relationships between all of the elements, um, but at the end of the day, you're also gonna need some way for your users to interact with that data unless you think that they're all going to learn how to write Sparkle queries. They're not. Um, so there has to be some way to throw, um, to throw up a user interface to let people interact with and query the data so you can slice, dice, facet, and filter uh, the results. Because this example that I've built out of a real scholarly article um, would be magnified by 900,000. So we're talking about an, an enormous graph database of millions and millions of triples. Um, so it is crucial to make sure that in the application that you're using, there's some kind of UI for the end users to be able to interact with the data without having to learn a query language. So the idea is that we can turn the structured data that's already available in the XML in discrete fields into a robust graph database that explicates the relationships between the various elements that describe each paper. So the extracted data describes the authors, the institutions, the countries that they're in, the topics normalized by some kind of taxonomy structure uh, and disambiguated so that you can ask accurate queries about your data. Moreover, expressing this data in RDF is an excellent step towards leveraging the semantic web of linked data uh, to further enrich the content and associate the metadata with external resources. The rise of persistent identifiers, uh, the adoption of which are, is well underway in scholarly circles, uh, provides additional opportunities for enriching content via external sources of information. So um, this might not be your world, so I'll talk a little bit about it. So for every uh, article gets a unique number called a DOI or digital object identifier. Um, Crossref is the body that holds and makes these DOIs, so there's a bunch of information associated with them. Um, and then uh, for concepts like taxonomy terms, indexing and categorization, you can link out to Wikidata or DBpedia, some other source um, of external uh, information describing that topic. The same thing exists for authors. There's a network called ORCID, which is an, uh, uh, an original researcher identification number that you can link the articles in your RDFs out to using additional triples. So extracting the information and expressing it in RDF is another step towards being able to do linked data and semantic um, web stuff. Uh, these are just a few of the potential links. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything I missed here. Uh, I'll just move on. Um, so, I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not the first person to be interested in converting JATS XML into RDF. Um, at the end of my slides, I'll provide some references for you, but what I'm not interested in doing, and you're probably not interested in hearing about, is explicating which fields map to which elements and how you validate that data. This is not that kind of technical talk. I'm more interested in framing the project and describing some pitfalls not mapping XML elements while you all watch me do it. Um, so this all sounds great. How are we going to accomplish it? The simple answer is that structured data is extracted, organized into RDF statements using some existing or custom-built ontology, 
loaded into some repository, and then surfaced using an endpoint. Those are the basic steps of what we have to do. Naturally, each of these steps involves a number of processes and applications which are subject to problems. Uh, so extracting the data that you're interested in is perhaps the easiest step. All the author's names are in a field called author name or something very much like that. The, uh, the journal name is in a field called journal name. So the elements are labeled, the data is in the elements, you can extract them um, and isolate each element. Um, since each element is already expressed as structured data, it's relatively simple matter to target and extract the elements that you're interested in. Um, in a scholarly paper, this could include things like the list shown, authors and their affiliations, title, date, journal, number, volume, a unique identifier, uh, which already exists as I described, which is extremely handy because you, it lets you tie everything to one unique number so you can maintain the sense of the original records even after you blow it up into a whole bunch of triple statements. Um, it's also extremely helpful to have some kind of topical indexing categorization tags, uh, call them what you want. Um, we call them taxonomy. Uh, this information may or may not be ex included in the source data that you're extracting the information from, and even if it is, um, it might not be reliable. Which brings me to my first digression, which is about controlled subject indexing. Uh, tagging, semantic enrichment, taxonomy. Now, I'm a taxonomist, so I can speak at length about this topic, but I won't. I'll keep it brief for now. Uh, but anytime you have a large number of objects, it is extremely useful to categorize them for analytical purposes. Uh, so for things like vast quantities of scholarly content, uh, useful categories can include things that are found in the metadata, like the document type and the data, uh, the author, which journal it was published in, um, and some quantifiable data, like the number of authors and so on. But to really analyze the content, you need some kind of taxonomy or thesaurus describing the domain that the paper is about. Uh, the classification of digital objects by topic allows us to define, codify, group, and relate large amounts of data, content data, uh, for analysis, uh, reporting and information retrieval, basically search. Um, so discover is broader than search, of course, browse and search are quite different, but there's no way to organize this quantity of information without some kind of classification scheme. Um, which this all comes to us by means of the old physical library problem that I have a book and I need to put it somewhere where people can find it. I only have one copy of the book and I need to have some kind of scheme to uh, figure out where to put it so that people can get it. Um, now, of course, with digital objects, you don't just have one copy or a single place, but when you have 900,000 papers, um, it's kind of impossible to browse through to find what you're looking for and you need some kind of uh, classification. Um, again, could talk about that at length, but I'm gonna let it go for now. So returning to our list of metadata to be extracted, we come to the question of the references or citations in an article where the author lists all the sources that they consulted to do their research. Um, it may indeed be desirable to include references and citations in a big graph. That way you could see this paper cited that paper, cited this paper, cited that paper, and you end up with a big network of citations. Um, in the STEM section of scholarly publishing, there are already several sources who do this. Scopus is a well-known database, and Google Scholar does an adequate job of this as well. But unless the URIs or DOIs are provided in the XML, it's very difficult to extract this information to include in the triples. Um, for newer papers, it's very common for people to include a URI link to all the papers they've referenced, but of course there's been a lot of published uh, literature, uh, you know, that was written before the last 15 years, and it's, uh, it's very unlikely that it's going to be there. Because in scholarly publishing, sometime around 1996, um, most STEM type publishers' data is born digital. The XML is the native format that this content was uh, produced and stored in. Um, content that was created too early to be native digital has been transformed into XML from some previous format. Maybe SGML, maybe PDFs or physical copies that were then ported over to PDFs and turned into XML um, in order to bring entire collections into the same XML format. Um, usually this was done with a combination of automated and brute, fort manual, brute, fort, brute force manual processes. Um, so it's very common for the structured field of data to be less than accurate in content that was pre-native digital. Um, if you add to this the problems that are propagated by OCR, 
which I'm sure we all love, uh, which has improved recently, but many organizations have OCR that was done in the 80s or even before that, and it can be very unreliable. Um, conversion to digital text. Um, so you have the potential for some quite a bit of mess in what is supposed to be clean structured data. This article from Nature is from 1869. So, um, so this leads us to the topic of data quality. The assumption is that since we have all this nice fielded data, whether it's an XML or a database or some other source, that the data com uh, contained in it is clean. But if there's anyone here at this data conference who's ever encountered a completely clean data set, I have yet to meet them. Uh, but for the type of scholarly content that I'm discussing in this talk, things like dates and journal information are pretty much unproblematic. The problem really comes with the uncontrolled values, particularly things like names. I'll talk more about this in a second. Um, Obviously, I think extracting dirty data into another structure is simply asking for errors to be compounded. Um, and using dirty data to make inferences and drive analysis is useless because you're not going to get correct answers out of your data. Um, but I suspect that at this particular conference, I don't need to preach to the choir about the value of clean data. Um, <coughs> excuse me. From quantity, uh, quality to quantity, uh, which is actually a related problem. The problem isn't that graph databases won't scale. You can extract as many triples as you want and load them someplace. They, they all scale uh, extraordinarily well. Um, so the sheer quantity of the number of triples to generate, store, and query isn't the problem. The problem is that anytime you have very, very large data sets, and I have some representative examples of some of the STEM type publishers I work with, there will always be edge cases that don't fit into the model. Sometimes, as described in the previous two slides, um, this is called by older content that has been converted to XML or whatever um, uh, that did not fit cleanly into the new schema, but everything had to get converted, so they converted it anyway. So there's junk in the fields. Um, because what I'm describing is another conversion. I'm, this structured data to RDF is another data conversion project, um, which you know, multiplies errors if we, let them, if we let them propagate. So quantity is not really a problem. The problem is that when you have this much quantity, there are going to be edge cases that don't fit the model very well. You're gonna have to make a assumptions that, uh, you know, that, that apply to 98% of the things that you're doing, and you're going to get a little bit of junk in there, um, no matter how careful you are. So when you're dealing with hundreds or thousands or millions of files, there's just a higher likelihood that there are going to be problems um, than if you have hundreds of objects. And so naturally, you can't write a script for each individual thing. You have to deal with the bulk of them. Uh, one of the common sticking points in this kind of data extraction and conversion is the problem of named entities. These problems come in several flavors. Um, any sufficiently large data set of academic literature, you will certainly find authors with the same names. In older data, you'll also find authors who only provided their first initial. It was very common until about the mid-1960s for you to just sign your paper, J. Smith, Harvard University. So we have trouble telling those authors apart. Um, now there, are, again, are some resources for this of persistent identifiers of researcher names. ORCID um, is great, but it has its own problems. And it's really only relevant for living authors and newer data. They don't, those persistent identifiers don't exist for um, authors in your legacy content. Um, but the most difficult problem is author name duplication and disambiguation. Uh, for institutions, educational institutions, but also research institutions, corporations, government agencies, and other organizations that have authors affiliated with them in the content, uh, the problem is similar. Uh, in most legacy data, there are freely entered versions of names which may or may not include department information, abbreviations, and so on. Here are some examples. This list of names is actually accepted from a data set of actual names from published academic content. Um, the duplicates in this excerpt indicate that the text string, like B.D. Silverman, occurred more than once. Uh, is Arthur Silverman the same person as Arthur R. Silverman? Are B.G. and Barry G. and Barry George Silverman the same person? In all cases. Uh, I will add that this particular data set 
had about 905,000 articles with an average of 3.5 authors per paper. So almost 4 million, 4.5 million raw names that we had to disambiguate. Um, so when we got done, we had a much cleaner list. We got it down to about 900,000 unique names, which is still a lot of person names. Um, several things are interesting about this. Clearly, at the end of the day, even with a clean list, you're going to have duplicate names, actual different people that have the same text string of their name, which means that a name is a poor candidate for the triple statement. You have to have an ID number attached to that person, and you can't just use the string of their name um, as the main object. But what's really interesting is how to distinguish the names from one another uh, and how to collapse records for the same person uh, expressed differently, like old Barry George Silverman here, into a single record. So we developed a process to look at the other metadata around the names. Uh, by taking, taking each of the 4.5 instances, 4.5 million instances of an author name, the first task is to make some determination of which authors to compare. There's no need to compare every author on a list of 4.5 million with every other offer. Mr. Zhang and Mr. Smith probably aren't the same person. So you need to do some clustering to determine things that are uh, likely matches using Levenstein distances and um, other kinds of NLP methods. Um, B.G. Silverman and Barry George Silverman are pretty far apart Levenstein-wise because of the number of um, uh, characters in the text strings, but if you use the last name, you can cluster things together that you want to compare to each other. Once we had clusters of similar names, we compared the other metadata in the paper. What topic did they publish on? Who were their co-authors? What, what uh, institution were they affiliated with? Um, and for newer content, do they have the same email address? That's a pretty good indicator. So we liked it when that happened. Um, but this analysis provided a series of similarity vectors which we could weight and compare. Um, email matches are obviously a very strong indicator. Co-author and topic matched and so forth. And so we had these series of weights then we compared all these names with um, to disambiguate them. Uh, and at the end of the day, we had some edge cases that the algorithm was unable to say yes or no, and we had to have humans actually go through and review um, some of these things to try and make a clean list. Institutional names are a slightly different challenge, especially the way that institutional names are expressed in free text entry data fields, especially from legacy data converted to digital. Um, again, this is an actual list of uh, text strings I extracted from actual published scholarly data. And it's very easy for a human to look at these and say, oh, well, um, these are the same, uh, and the other ones are not the same. Uh, but it's much harder to write a script to try and do this, especially when you don't have a canonical list of names to begin with, um, because all the deep, different abbreviations, iterations, and name changes that institutions go through. Um, and then throw in some non-primary English names um, and you have yourself another data mess, um, including transliterations and all kinds of other things. So text analytics could be of some help here. Um, you can see that pulling out words in certain proximities to each other and parsing on commas would help, uh, but there's only so much you can do and at the end of the day, again, you're going to have to have a little bit of human review um, at the end of your process. Uh, so just to round out the story for this data set with its four and a half million author names um, from about 900,000 records, we ended up with something like 30,000 unique institution names. Um, and again, uh, it's better to use some kind of um, ID number to represent these in your data than to try and use the string of the actual institution as the name because they're too similar. So although it, uh, in principle it seems very easy to extract structured data into RDF, because each field is an object, in practice there's quite a bit of work to do to ensure the quality of the data that's extracted, and especially with entities, named entities, um, some significant cleanup will be required. So at this point we have essentially a bunch of sheets or tables with fields of data extracted from the structured source material and in theory have applied some subject indexing, normalized the names of the people, and done some basic data cleanup and validation. Um, so now we need to put it into the graph, model it in RDF by explicating the relationships between these objects. Um, so ontologies serve two purposes here. In the uh, uppermost ontology, we need to define the classes of the objects that we have extracted uh, and give them properties and explicate what kinds of relationships they can have with each other. Second, we need to define the relationships between the objects, the predicates in our uh, graph database, as carefully and specifically as possible. 
The first type of ontology, sometimes called an upper ontology, is used to say that this object is a date and therefore it has certain formatting rules. This object is a name, it can have alternate names and has other properties and so on. So the upper ontology define the basic domain independent concepts as well as some basic relationships between them. An author is a person and things like that. Um, they can be extraordinarily useful for resolving your data set with other data sets. Um, if we all agree, for example, that we're going to use the same upper ontology uh, classes for names. Um, and they're generic. They are very broad, um, high level data object modeling. Core or intermediate ontologies are essentially the upper ontologies for broad application domains, specific to the field or the industry that your data is describing. Um, this might help you make real world decisions for which upper ontologies uh, may fall short for certain domains or what problems that you might find in them. Um, domain specific ontologies are the lowest level and are used to model topics and objects that are particular to the vertical or industry or uh, topic that you are dealing with. Um, this will include some kind of taxonomy or thesaurus vocabulary for um, uh, classification and other things. Uh, now I know there's some ambiguity here uh, and not every ontological structure is so cleanly categorizable uh, and this can be overwhelming. The good news is that lots of upper ontologies already exist. You don't have to build one. You can go find one that already exists in the world. Um, so some common upper ontologies, Psych, SUMO, and BFO, the basic formal ontology, are all widely used. They're more or less freely available. Um, you can go out in the world and find lots of information about them. You don't have to go build the upper ontology. That's the, that work has been done for you. These will all have basic objects and concepts already modeled in them. Um, one or the other might be a particular um, fit for your data. Psych is built for machine learning and complex objects. You might not ever need to model something like intangible object in your data, but they have something existing. I think that's kind of weird, but, um, but it works and is uh, wi widely used in machine learning type applications. SUMO, on the other hand, is a little less abstract. Um, it has measures and objects and processes, but it doesn't have things like intangibles. Um, in the end, you're gonna have to do a little exploring to figure out uh, which upper ontology is suitable for your project. Schema.org and the W3C are great places to start for that stuff. Um, there are lots of existing intermediate and domain ontologies, far too many to try and go through, but there are a couple of registries that you can look them up on. Bartok.org has, I think, surpassed everyone and is now the main place that people go look. It's uh, maintained by the University of Basel and it's a registry of taxonomies and ontologies that then point you to the owners of those things. So if you need to build an ontology to describe something in your model in a domain, go search there and see what you can find. Um, any existing domain ontology will probably require a little bit of customization on your part, subtracting or combining more than one structure to meet your needs. Be sure to check the licenses. Although many ontologies are freely available to use and adapt, uh, you may be uh, encouraged to upload your customizations to the library to build on a lot of these projects are done as open source uh, projects. Um, I think that's the most likely scenario, uh, is that you'll find something that works that you're gonna to need to do a little uh, addition and custom, uh, customization of. Um, what I do wanna emphasize is that it's very common to take objects from various ontological sources and combine them to suit your needs. Uh, most ontologies are structured in the same kinds of common languages that allow uh, for and facilitate this kind of combination. So now we have an upper level ontological structure that defines basic objects uh, and their most basic relationships. We have a bunch of data we extracted. Uh, we have one or more intermediate or domain level ontologies that are specific to your data, uh, use case and field. An author is a person, a research paper can have multiple authors and those kinds of definitions. Um, and we have the structured data from the XML uh, or whatever structure we pulled it out from. Uh, so with the time that we have left, what are we going to do with all this information? How can people access it? We need to put it in a big, beautiful graph. So we need some place to store our triples. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but there are, um, uh, there are a bunch of data sets out there to get an idea of the potential size of the data sets. Here's a nice table I found. 
uh, the sources at the link. Um, and these are fairly major projects, um, but reading numbers like 50 million to 2 billion triple statements uh, suggest that scalability is a factor. So even if you're not Microsoft or Amazon, uh, you can easily find yourself with millions and millions of triple statements. Um, and some of the organizations on, in this table publish their own triple stores. There are a great variety of options on the market. Um, there are, oh, my slide got gummed up a little bit, but that's okay. Um, this is just a, a, a brief look at some of the places. Um, a lot of NoSQL databases have places you can put your triples. There are specific graph databases and triple stores. Um, there's a whole lot of options out there, and it's, I think, still growing at this point. So uh, this list is not exhaustive, and my categories are not cut and dried, but I wanted to try and give you an idea of some of the products that are out there to store your graph databases in. Some are open source, some are extraordinarily expensive enterprise level products. Um, so uh, again, you're gonna have to do a little research. You know, do you want something cloud-based and so forth um, to select the right application for you? So we've got our data cleaned, we've got our data loaded, we've got our data organized. How can we search the data? Um, well, we can obviously go up, gin up whatever Sparkle endpoint is included with the graph database and write queries there, um, which is great and really powerful if you've learned or are willing to learn the Sparkle syntax, which is not very hard, uh, but you'll have plenty of users who are unwilling or otherwise resistant to non-graphical interfaces. Um, fortunately, most graph databases have a graphical interface that can be used, repurposed, or sometimes even embed in other applications using API calls um, or some kind of browser-based um, access point, um, which is fantastic for browsing the data and a little harder for writing queries. Um, so most of the out-of-the-box options are pretty technical or limited uh, to the built-in features of the graph database. The best interfaces I've seen have been custom designed for specific users um, to write queries from specific data sets because they already know what kind of filters and slicing and dicing um, they want to do. So what's interesting about this to me is that we're still limiting our thinking about how this data can be queried based on our old ideas about how to query relational databases. But I think we're on the verge of some more interesting ways to interact with RDF databases. Um, and uh, I'm curious to see what's gonna happen with that in the near future. Just a couple of last things. One of the benefits of RDF style graph databases is this ability to infer additional triples from the data you have to use it for inferencing, which is, which is extraordinarily powerful. Um, essentially, this means that you can derive additional triple statements that you did not explicitly express based on the triples and the object properties that you have explicated in your data. So this diagram is the simplest of all examples. If I have a triple that says Socrates is a human and one that says humans are mortal, I can infer that Socrates is mortal. This may, not, this may seem trivial, but it's actually extraordinarily powerful um, and a major reason to go with a graph database to begin with. Lastly, I'd like to talk just a little bit about developing processes. How are we doing on time? Good. To continue to extract normalize and add data to your emerging graph. Um, although converting and modeling the back file of content is an enormous task, uh, you, the new content will also need to be processed and added as triples to the graph database to keep your RDF up to date. Uh, this should, if done well, be far less painful than the initial conversion, modeling, cleaning, and loading. Um, all the object definitions and relationships should already be in place. Um, uh, again, you're gonna have to deal with things like entities. So you might have to put a little bit of human review process in there um, to see if they match an existing um, uh, object in your database. Um, but to, prev to prevent introducing errors, it's worth having a way to review the entities that are extracted and QC them, because it's much harder to find them downstream after you've already added them to the database. So once the data conversion, cleaning, and validation are in good shape, it's important to make them available as ongoing operations, not just a one-time conversion process. Um, so you may find various places in the document lifecycle or your data pipeline or workflow during which you want to grab and convert, format, clean, validate uh, some of the data and add it to the RDF graph. Um, this example, again, comes from the scholarly publishing world. So my plan when I projected this talk is we were doing um, a project with one of my customers, the IEEE, uh, and I was hoping that at the end of this talk, I would show you the really cool interface that they've built for their graph database. Um, but it's not done. 
So I can't show it to you. So the anticlimax at the end of my talk is that I don't have a cool interface to show you. I will talk a little bit about it. They have about 4.8 million total documents in their repository. Again, with something like three to four authors per document. So we're talking about a whole lot of tripled data. And they're well on their way. They've got a new SQL database. They're converting things and loading them in. But um, at the end of the day, uh, I can't show you the endpoint because it's not done yet. There was every reason to believe it would be done when I submitted this paper to this conference. So um, I'll have to come back another year and uh, give you the final, um, uh, the final form of what it looked like. But it's going to end up being something like 200 million triples. So we're very excited about it, and I can't wait to see it, but I can't show you. So instead, I'm going to leave you with the list of references that I talked about, um, hoping that these can help you with your own projects. There's a mix here of links that go to things that describe on places you can find out about graph databases. Um, if anyone's interested in my slides, please shoot me an email from the speaker list and I'll be happy to share all of them or even just this one if, if, that, if that's what you want. Um, and that's all I have for today. Thank you. <laughs>